Well, hello, everybody. My name is David Lease. I'm your proud host of Leaders on the Frontier, and a warm welcome to everybody joining us on X as well as on YouTube. We're uh, delighted that you could join us for this live discussion, and we certainly welcome your, your, your questions and your comments on this very important topic. Did you know it's April the 1st, just around the corner, as we talk to you on March the 28th? It's hard to believe. So are you looking forward to... April Fool's Day. Well, I don't know about you, but I think you and a lot of Canadians are probably not looking forward to, to April Fool's Day because on April the 1st, we've got a big increase in carbon taxes um, our way from courtesy of the federal government. So we want to talk about that today, about carbon taxes, and that's really part of a larger puzzle, a larger picture about this incredible effort to change your way of life. And this is gonna have a big impact. And so I am delighted to welcome our special guest today, the Honorable Dan Mateague. And Dan is a great friend. He's the president of Canadians for Affordable Energy. He's also got quite a background as a minister within uh, previous liberal governments, both in terms of domestic responsibilities as also the uh, foreign affairs portfolio. So a warm welcome to you, my friend, Dan. David, it's always a pleasure and uh, good to be here just before the Easter long weekend and the mayhem that we're going to see come Monday. Yeah, who'd ever believe it that uh, on this um, mon uh, Monday, Thursday, just uh, uh, around the corner, we're going to look to a major increase in carbon taxes. And I want to break this down because I, I think that um, you bring an awful lot of knowledge and insight around the the incredible long and twisting journey in terms of how we've gotten to the point where we're, where we are today. So, um, Dan, gosh, what are you hearing from coast to coast across this country? You're the president of Canadians for Affordable Energy. You're an advocate for Canadians. Why is affordable energy so important? Because for the longest time, David, it's been ignored. It's been trivialized. It's been minimized. Uh, it has been part of the public discourse. And it's likely that people didn't feel the real pain, the sting, uh, or the threat to their collective livelihoods that uh, carbon taxes and other green initiatives are, uh, are inflicting on average Canadians. We're now dealing not with just energy inflation, but of course, it's consequential in impact on food. Uh, on the cost of living, on you know housing, on on rent, everywhere you turn, they're not necessarily connected. But there's an awful lot of interconnectedness. When you start messing with energy prices, it has that compounding effect throughout the economy. And you know, David, this morning I took some time on X on Twitter to look at some of the stuff I'd written back in 2019, and there it was mm. in, in black and white. You know, I, I warned that this was going to happen, and I also warned my erstwhile <laughs> liberal colleagues don't play with this this is you're playing with fire and i knew that going back a decade earlier two decades earlier it's the reason i got into going after uh, competition issues on gasoline to groceries mm -hmm. and saying you know mm -hmm. the consequential impact of all these things would be to you know to lessen the ability for people to make ends meet and i think unfortunately there hasn't been a lot of attention paid to uh, you know bread and butter issues and unfortunately for uh, my colleagues uh, under the name liberal and i would say to a lesser extent ndp it's going to likely lead to their uh eradicature if you will their 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 doom in the next 20 months whenever election is called because wow. they do continue to want to uh, proceed with this very very bad public policy well this is big public policy that's going to hit canadians square between the eyes in terms of i think what you've been saying for years so bravo on you Dan, for talking about how these policies affect uh, the affordability of living life as ca in, in Canada. I mean, it's just incredible. We live in um, what's called the northern part of North America. Much of it is pretty darn cold. And I, I would say largely uninhabitable unless we had the technology to live here comfortably, like beautiful homes and all the rest but affordable energy, right, Dan? So this is just foundational to our way of life. And, and they're just going right at it, aren't they? They are. And, you know, it, it's not just government. It's, you know, it's the science committee. It's media. Uh, it is mm -hmm. people who ought to know better, who completely bought into the idea that uh, because there is a climate crisis, I happen to believe there isn't, 
uh, but now that we have unusual weather, we're, we're alerted to this idea that somehow we've done something bad and we have to do something, uh, you know, along the lines of uh, tithing or perhaps uh, looking after, uh, you know, paying more because uh, we feel guilty. It's, it's really some very, very bad policy mixed in with, a, you know, a, a sort of a psychological behavior that I've never seen in Canadians before. They've been very resilient, very willing to push ahead with mm. better ideas. But you're quite right. You've laid it out very well. We are among the most prohibitive countries in which to live, and yet we've done so much good with our resources. So much good. We have countries coming to us saying, please share some of those resources with us. But we say there's no business case. It's wow. woke history so and it's I damaging. I, I think that's that's fascinating timing, isn't it, Dan? That I think it was this last week that the president of Greece, no less, uh, again made another overture to our prime minister saying, gosh, that energy, whether it's liquefied natural gas or oil and gas in whatever form, Greece would welcome the opportunity to trade with us. Just And this reminds me of the trips this, I think it was this past year that we had um, representatives from both uh, Germany as well as Japan and of course others. I know that um, uh, a few summers ago I was in, in the UK and talking with um, an international trade representative and we said, look, we could, we could be supplying all the UK's energy needs. In fact, we could do it for all of Europe and that would be just such a, a huge, I would say, impact in a positive way when it comes to the environment um, and, and in terms of energy security with, with Russia, um, you know, impacting uh, the supply of energy to Europe, Canada could be that solution, couldn't we, Dan? Well, why not? We're, we have we, our coast stretches from Pacific to Atlantic. Uh, we have coasts on the Atlantic and on the Pacific. We have a nation that uh, can deliver to both Asia and Europe and Africa at the same time. Mm -hmm. We have the third largest provable reserves of oil in the world. We're the yeah. fifth largest exporter, all of it, of course, the United States on natural gas. And we have, uh, you know, anywhere from between the fourth and the sixth largest natural gas mm -hmm. reserves. Look, there's no secret, and the world knows, when it comes to resources, a stable country that knows how to get its act together and does things in a reasonable uh, and, uh, you know, using the highest standards available, that be labor environment, is Canada. And so, you know, we have this sort of idea that we should shame ourselves into believing that we've done something bad, when in fact what we've, we've done is denied not just them, but ourselves the opportunity to provide energy for a much cleaner world. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Dan. So I did want to pause for a moment and ask um, our audience for our questions. I'm talking with the Honourable Dan Mateague, President of Canadians for Affordable Energy, as well as former Cabinet Minister in Liberal Governments. And Dan brings a wealth of experience and insight on energy matters. And so when it comes to April the 1st, can you help us, Dan, understand what will be really the impacts um, at the consumer level when it comes to say filling up your tank what how is this going to impact your budget uh, as a canadian is there a, a short answer to that probably going to wind up costing average people an extra two to three dollars a week just for fuel and that's for gasoline it goes up because it goes up 3.3 .3 cents a liter plus gst or hst or hst at 13 percent or 15 percent depending if you're in ontario or in the maritimes uh, the reality is that uh, that is uh, on top of an existing. So it goes from, if you will, 14.61 cents a liter, which it currently is, plus HST, GST, to 17.61 cents a liter. All in all, we're paying about 20 cents a liter. It represents about 10 to 14 percent of the entire total cost of, of, of uh, gasoline and even higher for diesel because it goes across the board up 4.01 cents a liter. And I haven't looked at the numbers lately, but that takes us up to about 22, 21.4 cents a liter plus HST and GST, a pretty big impact. And that's the stuff that winds up uh, driving costs of farming to costs of transportation, whether that be train, whether that be jet, or whether that be transport truck. Mm -hmm. So I think your point is so important not to miss and that is that this has a cascade effect a domino effect if you will it's not just hitting people at the pump this cascades all through the economy because historically canada one of our ace cards in our economy our, our levels of productivity has been reliable affordable energy so they're they're really undermining that so this is going to go and hit manufacturers 
when it's going to hit people in forestry, mining, agriculture, everywhere you turn. Is that is that your point that you're trying to make here, Dan? Yeah, it makes us generally uncompetitive and it makes us uncompetitive not only within the Federation, within the country, but also mm -hmm. with respects to other nations. And so manufacturers, and I speak to many of them through my colleagues, Catherine Swift at uh, the Coalition Concerned uh, Business Manufacturers, keeps telling me, look, we're, we're losing ground here and we're losing it because other countries may get around this by you know, saying, well, we can meet our climate objectives because we weren't as trendy as Canada. We decided to shut down coal plants after we signed the deal. Unlike Canada, cut shut down coal plants before the deal and transitioned to natural gas. There is a significant correlation between what the government has been doing and the uh, very alarming commentary made by the Bank of Canada, which supports the view that our uh, GDP to capital, cap per capita, is falling, and it will fall to the lowest level among OECD members by 2060. That means our children are going to wind up being laggards in a nation in which we're always in the top 10. We're going to be now dead last, bottom of number 60 in OECD okay, nations. So, so That's a very I, scary can point. Can you repeat that? Because I'm, I'm not sure if people would have necessarily caught that. You're referring to a recent, I think as of yesterday, yes. uh, report by the deputy governor of the bank of canada saying that there's a productivity emergency in canada is that it is that what you're referring that's to? exactly what it is we uh we per capita are not producing uh in quite the way we did before um not just because of an aging population not just because of a new population but because what we are producing and the means by which we can make the transitions with technologies uh and provide the world that which it needs we're falling behind we are not backing our winners. Our winners are the resource sector, our agriculture mm -hmm. sector, our manufacturing sector. Yes, our tech sector. But all those seem to be pivoting on only one thing and one thing only. Government grift, government money to go buy things that the world already knows it can make. You don't have to worry about hydrogen. The rest of the world knows how to make it in the process of making cement and all sorts of other products. The world knows how to make electric vehicles. The world knows how to make uh, you know, windmills and turbines. The world knows how to make solar panels. That we're saying that Canada should be able to do these things and throwing a lot of federal money and taxpayer borrowed money really suggests that we're losing the uh, the game here. And the game is really to ensure that we have something that is attractive and for which our labor market can be resilient, mm -hmm. responsive or not. No, I, I think you make a very good point. And, and thank you for referencing the significant challenges that Canada has in terms of our productivity and it's uh, declining and really is a kind of an ominous foreshadow of a of a really what will be a declining standard of living for Canadians is that a is that a fair comment Dan well it's a it's a proxy for a standard of living and if uh, your 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 per GDP capita is in productivity is declining it means their standard of living is in free fall and, uh, you know, you well, can't blame international factors. If that were the case, other nations would be going the same direction. After COVID, we've gone in a very different direction. We're down. The United States is up. Europeans are up. Asia, Asian nations are up. We, uh, we have a serious problem, and it has a lot to do with uh, a government that doesn't know how to govern, but at the same time doesn't know how to back its winners. And uh, the winners that it has, it's keeping it in the game, are being uh, hmm. constantly assaulted. Look, I, I take no pleasure in saying the fact that if... Uh, we were to get rid of the oil and gas sector overnight, which was, which is what this government wants to do. Uh, we would leave ourselves in, a, in a, an awful situation, be very, very quickly put on the direction of the International Monetary Fund. We would be a basket case because we we would lose 10 to 12 percent of our GDP. And that would uh, that would make a bit, bad situation already worse. And by the way, interest rates go through the roof. Yeah. Wow. No, that is a hard hitting analysis. I think a lot of Canadians would be very shocked to know that this federal government is on a mission to shut down Canadian oil and gas, period. That's not in doubt in your mind. Not at all. And it's tragic because it's the 20 to 30 billion bucks every year in revenues net. A lot of these disingenuous types keep saying it's they're subsidized. If you're talking about business write-offs as being subsidies, then you might as well have that hang on every business. The fact that you would have methane regulations, oil and gas caps, that you would only block pipelines, prevent uh, ships from getting into uh, to supply and to take away our product. All of these obstructions have been placed under the mantra of net zero. And we have done more damage to the very golden goose that keeps this economy going. Anybody who thinks that they can run an economy 
less 30 billion bucks, or in this case, you know, lose about seven or 8% of GDP or of your annual revenues. Good luck with that. Hmm. Because not only are we going to be seeing a decline in productivity and, and, and labor, we're also seeing, of course, a massive increase in the amount of debt this government is taking. It scares me. I served for a government that tried to get rid of it. And it was uh, very painful. We're heading towards there very quickly with a generation that seems to have forgot the sacrifices that were made by Canadians 20 and 30 years ago. You're absolutely right. Yeah, this country was built through the incredible hard work of many generations and it was saved up and built up over time uh it wasn't easy uh but it's almost like we're just running our country down and it's it's crazy and then um it, it's it's fascinating because when you reference productivity or standard of living i know that and this is an all deference to um south korea but now Canada is at the same standard of living as South Korea. And, and I know that South Korea is an incredible country, but we're on the way down as they're on the way up. And this is just a really bad news story for Canadians. And I know that's not a, an easy thing to hear, but that's really what's going on. Is it not, Dan? Well, I mean, I'm not going to uh, paraphrase uh, uh, the words of that great Korean uh, singer, uh, open Gangnam style, but you know, we're oh, looking yes. <laughs> at, uh, you know, a, a reduction in, in possibilities. The song very much about some people living in a beautiful vicinity of the rest living in relative uh, dire straits and, and, and difficulty. Mm -hmm. Look, it doesn't have to be this way. And we don't have to say that we're not going to do what we have to do when it comes to the climate. But my goodness, we our obsession with this thing to the exclusion of everything else that we have taken as a consequence of the reality about us is going to lead to our national ruin. And my appeal is to people in Toronto and in Montreal who keep voting for this and don't recognize that the calamity that they're voting for is only going to be inflicted more arduously on them than any other constituency. So if you mm -hmm. think you can live without farming and you can live without energy and you can live without manufacturing and you can live without uh, a government that keeps its financial commitments uh, uh, steady, good luck with that. Because sooner or later, wow. the wolves will be at our doors, not not uh, someone okay. else's. Well, let's uh, let's channel our fellow Canadians right across the country, including in Montreal and Toronto. And uh, you can help us do that, Dan. But uh, no, that's a challenge then to our fellow Canadians to pay attention and open our eyes in terms of what's going on. So let's let's peel that perennial onion and uh, let's get at this. And. And I want to understand what's really going on here, because you hear a lot of rhetoric or a lot of messaging saying, well, the carbon tax is a price on pollution. And this is the way to, you know, safeguard our country from the impending doom of climate crisis. I can I can hear or see and see Greta Thunberg's the the the, the, the young woman and all deference to her as a, a Swede. Um, wagging her finger at us saying how dare we um so when we look at this is this not the policy response to impending doom of climate change dan so man don't you care about the environment what shouldn't we be all in favor of the carbon tax <laughs> well i think we need a great reset but it's a great great reset back to reality um and if people believe that hysteria is a good way in which to conduct pu public policy uh, then I would suggest that they want to look at the history of those who've been purveyors of this uh, this hysteria, of this panic uh, approach to public policy making, because they've failed. Uh, you know, I, my, I in my time I can go back to you know the days of uh, the population bomb. Uh, you know, uh, concerns about uh, there would be no more ice caps by twenty. 10, uh, the Al Gores of this world, the, uh, there have been many who have come before these false prophets who've basically said the world as we know it will end and it's because of us that it must end and you must do less with mm -hmm. than what you have. Look, mm -hmm. the hypocrisy of those folks aside, and I take no, you know, I have nothing personal to say about people and their, their private habits, sure. but they want to impose on us a regime, a control, a command structure that somehow legitimizes the role of government. And if you want governments to run your life, that may work for some people, but for a lot of other people, there's a cost. And it's not just a physical okay. financial cost, it's one that restricts our liberties. It's one that brings into question our democracy uh, and, our, and, and our liberties that we take for granted, the freedoms that we, uh, that we have all fought for and enjoyed. There's a modicum of responsibility. Yes, we have that, 
but not at the expense of taking everything away, including our ability to make uh, make a decent standard of living. And I, you know, I know that a lot of this is, is couched in and not coincidentally to anti-capitalism. So the propaganda machine by the left and by the Greens uh, has eerily is eerily familiar to the stuff that we saw under, you know, regimes that followed Karl Marx. And, uh, you know, for many of us, uh, we're not putting up with it. If, of course, we believe there's a climate emergency, fine, then say so. Uh, but I don't believe there is. And I think the idea that we can rile people up by saying there is one and get municipalities to write all sorts of nonsense to provincial governments to shut down natural gas plants or you have people uh, demonstrating in the streets, give your heads a shake. You know, do not use weather as a symptom or as an example uh, of, uh, of a climate going wrong. Frankly, if you look at the longer term weather patterns, it hasn't changed. We'd like to think we have. Mm-hmm. And climate's done in mm-hmm. periods of 100, 300, 500, 5 million years, not five minutes or five days. By the way, a good friends at the weather station, I often say, I have many of them working there over the years. You can't get the weather right in five hours. How are you planning to get the weather right for the next six <laughs> or seven uh, years? So, uh, look, I, I know what people are looking for. But if you think that one gas, an inert gas like CO2, is going to cause the end of the world, you've got another thing mm-hmm. coming in terms of uh, a, a day of, uh, of awakening. Yeah, so you've, man, you're really giving us a lot of reality therapy today, Dan. So you're kind of making a point here that we care about the environment, but this is not a crisis. Even if you use the um, parties like out of the UN panel, they're modeling on uh, climate change and temperature change. We're talking basically a degree over 80 years. Well, don't tell me that that's an imminent existential threat. And and thousands of scientists agree with this point. There's no consensus on this. There's a raging debate. So, but for whatever reason, you're saying that that parties, including this federal government, have taken up the cause of climate alarmism as a kind of a pretext to make a lot of big changes in people's lives in terms of the form of a bigger state. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm going to put words in you your know, mouth here. Justin Trudeau brought in an activist, a well-known activist who 20 years ago had been considered loopy and was jailed twice, uh, arrested twice yeah. for his his stuff. That's Stephen Gibo. Read very carefully where this guy comes from. I mean, this guy is not yeah. your average, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, garden variety activist. This guy is hmm. uh, pretty serious about what he wants. And he does want us to have 15 minute cities. He does not want us to have cars. He doesn't want us to own our home. He doesn't like the fact that, wow. you know, uh, we've seen examples of where, you know, uh, what happened in Wired uh, in, um, uh, where was that place uh, many years ago, Walkerton, where we had the crisis there, where he made mock and said, this is nature's revenge, where he said, this is what happens with fossil fuels and that may gone sick. Look, If you carefully study where these people are coming from, they are on the fringe of society and their ideas are not mainstream in much the same way that you can't make an argument for a climate crisis. uh, They have to continue to convince, to connive and to con you into believing that the world is coming to an end. And if they can do that, then, of course, you're going to have everyone's attention. They're scared at the idea that their climate crisis narrative is falling to pieces globally. And as a result of that, they're losing control of what they want to put in okay. place. It's well, happening very quickly, by the way. Okay, so that's fascinating because I've I, I think I'm 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 on your page, Dan, in the sense that it seems like that whole narrative of an imminent climate crisis is falling apart. I mean, you see scientific report after scientific report weighing and saying this is this is not this is not accurate. Um, is your sense that the the government itself is is actually waking up to that reality? Because I I get the impression that some of these people um, and I don't mean to be unfair to them personally at all, but it's almost like a religion to them. It's like a, a kind of a faith where they say yes, the meaning of life is to fight quote climate change, but we don't want to talk about the facts and evidence. We don't want to talk about this and certainly in the form of a healthy debate. With the other side it's very hard to get them in a room to have a debate um it's it's almost like our highway or um you know you're we're going to try to cancel you so you've got to go along with this and as a proof (laughs) of your virtue you will you will adopt this carbon tax and you will like it am i being too simplistic dan no, because I think it's pretty clear the record is very adamant about this. We we tend to take uh, the words of the the words of the Economic Forum uh, or the United Nations inter, 
uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We tend to exaggerate even some of the most weirdest of models. And we tend to think of those as the need for sudden and immediate policy. When in fact, mm -hmm. you know, what I think we're doing here is a disservice to the reality that is about us. And that is in recognizing that, uh, you know, these are things that uh, some believe we have to champion. I think a lot more of us are starting to say, wait a minute, it's time to hit the pause button and to uh, take a deep breath and look before we leap. Uh, we have challenges to be sure, but if anyone out there is suggesting just for a moment uh, that uh, some of our policies are based on, you know, uh, the outcome that we want, which is a better life for people, this is not what they're after. They don't care about the life of people. In fact, let's be honest, there's a there's a hint of Malthusianism in what they're doing. They want to control population. They also want to deconstruct population to ensure that there aren't enough people out there that are going to despoil the planet. So look, I'm willing to work with them on the environmental issues, all of them. And I think we're doing a good job in that mm -hmm. area. We have to do more. But when you tell me that CO2 is a pollutant, then I know you're dealing with what is scientifically dishonest. Yeah. And if you're going to pursue that, you better be able to tell people that you're not following the scientific method and that you have no credibility mm -hmm. in espousing that. We know that the entire infrastructure of money going to these grifters would come and fall to pieces the very second, as I said earlier, the climate crisis is declared not to be such a thing. Yeah, no, I, I excellent point, Stan. And, and just to be clear, carbon dioxide is foundational to life on this planet. Um, you know, not too far from here, there are greenhouses after greenhouses where they pump CO2 into them to nurture plant life. I mean, this is just basic science. And so um, there's certainly been, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a tale told here that suggests that CO2 is, is a pollutant. I mean, it's just utterly insane. So what we have here is also, I think, a very practical discussion. And I think we could use it, uh, we could cite a couple things. One is that even if we shut down Canada tomorrow, like everything was shut down, manufacturing, services, you stop driving, like we just went back to the Stone Age, it wouldn't make a difference in terms of the climate. And everybody knows this. So why are we pursuing policies that will change the face of the middle class? It will ruin uh, people's livelihoods and choices that really give them a future for them and their families. Because the very, very raison d'etre of the people who are pushing this would disappear. You wouldn't need these people. You would have to hear from these people. They wouldn't be your politicians. They wouldn't be your scribes and media, and they certainly wouldn't be your scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, there has to be some understanding of the interconnectivity between the end of the Cold War and the need for governments to find something. You know, if tomorrow I were to come to everybody and say there's no climate crisis, you know, uh, as a scientist, as an academic, uh, as a media. Uh, as a weather station, I wouldn't uh, wouldn't be able to make any money from anyone. There be yeah. there has to be some crusade towards an outcome that says something bad is happening, and how do we address it? I'm simply pointing out what I think has become more and more obvious to people is that if there is in fact a change in our climate, given that much of it cannot be done by mankind, given that we're talking about three percent of 004 percent. Uh, of which Canada is responsible for 1.5%. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, there's no and there's no amount of analogies you can use, but are you going to rip down the CN Tower because you found a speck of salt on it that has to be destroyed? That's what they're asking for. And mathematically, it doesn't make sense because scientifically, they're on very, very thin ice and they know it. So are the politicians who are aping the, uh, the positions taken by scientists who they pay to come forward with the idea that of an existential threat. It's not. Yeah. And uh, you know, I'm gonna be my kids are gonna be here, everyone's gonna be here for a long time to come. So chill, sit back, relax, and get rid of these people as quickly as possible. Yeah, no, absolutely right. And in the meantime, hey, let's work with those municipalities like in Victoria, I believe, Montreal, and treat their sewage that goes directly right into the water. How does that care about the environment? That's absurd. These guys are hypocrites, aren't they? Big time. And they're the first ones to uh, jump on, you know, the latest jet to get over to uh, their climate conferences every year. Uh, they're the same people who live excessively, but then contemptuously suggest others, you know, behave better. Don't do as I do, do as I say. Uh, that kind of, you know, imperialism is just beyond contempt 
for humanity. And it demonstrates the extent to which our politicians are out of touch with people. When mm -hmm. someone this afternoon goes to try to buy some food for the Easter long weekend mm -hmm. and realizes that there's some items they're going to have to put back on the shelf, the short answer is blame your liberal NDP and green politicians for that one, mm -hmm. because there's a connection between these unnecessary taxes based on a fraud and, and a hoax and a scam uh, that somehow we're doing something very bad by the worst of the Earth's environment. Nothing could be further from the truth. To believe oh. that is one thing. To be bamboozled by it is another. To be hammered financially by it is inexcusable. It's time for these people, literally, to go. Wow. So there you hear it from the Honorable Dan Mateague. Um, he's really serving it up straight to us um, on so many fronts. And I think I do have a question from the audience, and that is, Will the carbon tax wash as we get rebates back from the government? What do you say, Dan? Well, which carbon tax are we talking about? The one that you currently get, which the parliamentary budget officer says most people do not get back what they pay in because the parliamentary budget officer did what Dan McTague did four years ago. You're buying uh, you know, a liter of gasoline with a 10% you know, a, a uh, hike on it won't mean that the cost of gasoline itself is all you pay. You know full well that the delivery guy or girl or whoever has to also include that in their price. Take your Uber. It's already in there. Take your food. It's already in there. Yeah. No, right. the, when the rebate comes out to basically a shell game, basically, well, it's not a rebate. It's a bribe. It's bribing you with your own money, but giving you far less in return. Bribe. And so, you know, but don't take my word for it. Wait till the second carbon tax hits you. In the maritime, six and eight cents a liter is now the clean fuel standard or clean fuel regulation. That adds... Mm -hmm. And there's no rebate to that. In BC, it's 17 cents. Wait till Ontario, Saskatchewan, Alberta, Manitoba, and Quebec have to pay this. And you know what? Because the fur is going to fly. It's going to be very, very damaging. It means at the end of the day, you're ad artificially adding to the price of the energies that we need to live and the energies we need to get by on. By the way, no EV is built without fossil fuels and a hell of a lot of it. Yeah, no, exactly. So, um, I'm talking with Dan Mateague, and so I welcome your questions, and some are coming in here, including, um, do you think this will break up the, the, our, our federation as provincial premier after provincial premier opposes this carbon tax? No, I don't. Uh, I think the pain is going to get worse. Uh, I think the uh, Bank of Canada is now having to look at the fact that inflation may be here a lot longer and it's going to have to make a quick decision as to whether or not it maintains these high interest rates, maintains them because the federal government is spending money hand over fist. We're going deeper and deeper into debt. Now, I think the Federation will survive, but only on condition that there is a new government that is prepared to take a completely 180 degree shift away from this. Now, I've said to people this morning, one of the best ways you do it, cut off all the funding to these charities because they don't do charitable work. Start putting the audits back on those charities. Make sure that all of the grift that we've put out there is uh, is sound. In other words, it's standing on its own. No more subsidies. We're a nation in debt. We can't afford frills like subsidies for rich people to go around virtue signal. I think the government does that. It sends a very strong signal, not just of the first carbon tax, okay. the second carbon tax, and now mentions the folly of pursuing net zero. If a government comes out and says nix net zero, they'll have a landslide majority for several generations. Wow. So are you saying that this carbon tax issue, and it's kind of like an iceberg issue because it reflects so many related issues of you, as you've outlined, is kind of like the tip of the spear when it comes to almost like a referendum on the current NDP liberal government then? Is that, is that, do you think that's where we're going to be heading in the next election that from a policy point of view, this is going to be the question? Well, I think it's the question already. It's going to remain, but I think it, between now and the next election, more will be added to it. Uh, yes, it is the uh, low hanging fruit. It's easy to go after it because it doesn't do what I think even its own architects. Now, economists have said, oh, this is perfect. This sends a price signal. William Nordhaus, the um, climate economist who came up with the idea and advocated and wrote for a, a carbon tax said it works if you don't wreck it by putting in other regulations, which this federal government has done. Clean fuel standard, 
uh, you know, uh, emissions caps, methane caps, national building code standards, uh, you know, electric vehicle mandates, uh, reduction, in, all these other add-ons that the, that the trendies like Mr. Gibo and his gang from the various uh, activist groups uh, around the world have larded on will destroy the impetus of the one carbon tax, which was designed to maybe change and modify behavior. However you look at it, it is very much a lightning rod issue, but it's not the only one. Get rid of the carbon tax and you still have big problems. You can't get pipelines built. You can't restore the, the significant importance of the Canadian dollar. Look, I'm 135 pennies by US dollar. Every commodity we have in this country is priced on the US greenback and our relationship to it. We no mm -hmm. longer have the yes. petrodollar status. So it's costing us, we're losing one third of our purchase power. No wonder people feel frustrated, David. Yeah, no, exactly. So that's another part of what a lot of people don't think about is the affordability crisis is the decline of our dollar. Mm -hmm. And again, that's a, that's a, what is it, Dan, a, a very powerful um, indication of a decline of a nation. It is, and it demonstrates the extent to which no one has confidence in our future. But that's only because we're telling people to get lost. It wasn't just the prime ministers and presidents and chancellors of some of our best friends and trading partners that we said take a hike where there's no business case. I mean, we've been saying this to large companies who wanted to build LNG. You know, it was 2017, $36 billion that uh, was offered by uh, the Indonesian company, uh, whose name is Casey, we're now thinking about it in just a second. Uh, we said no. We, we, we created this environment in which we basically discourage people from making those investments on something the world desperately needs. So I think it was called Patronus. Patronus, that's right. So Qatar, Australia, United States, they can build it all. We can't. That says to me that this is signaling an example of a political behavior of political interference caused by the federal Trudeau liberals that has uh, scuppered not only our chance of getting products to the world, but also damaged everybody because we have a Canadian dollar that is no longer shielding us against the vagaries of these uh, inflationary hits that we're taking left and right in a second hand. No, I, I think that's a, that's a brilliant insight, Dan. So help us understand another part of what's going on here. Like you've been, you were a, a formerly a, a liberal insider, so to speak. And, 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 the Liberal Party has a long history, obviously, of, of governing Canada. Um, and more recently, you had, well, like prime ministers such as uh, Jean Chrétien and Paul Martin undertaking really a kind of a transformative fiscal uh, change of our country when we looked at massive deficits and debt. And they had the courage and the insight to be able to deal with that deficit. And, and they came out of it as a pretty popular government, so to speak. Um, so what what do we have now in terms of a leadership in that Liberal Party? I mean, is it the same party that you were familiar with? Like from a policy point of view, and I, I mean this not in a partisan way, I mean this in an objective policy perspective. If you look after issue after issue, are we dealing with the same Liberal Party that you- Well, no, not at all. Not at all. And and it would be easy to point this out because the same Liber Liberal Party today would not forget the sacrifices of the Liberal Party of yesterday in getting the financial house of the country in order. And it did so not because Liberals thought it was cool or because Conservatives weren't doing it. It's because we got the cooperation of the provinces and people who said, yes, the situation is out of control. It is now out of control again. This is a group of individuals who took over power and took a, the finances of a good country and basically, you know, directed it off a cliff. And as a result, uh, save and except for bond rating agencies who are somehow mystically still believe that we can use the CPP uh, as some kind of leverage, as uh, some kind of collateral against our, our ever growing deficits and debt. Uh, if it were not for that miscue, which no government can use, I know they've tried, I know our government tried it in 1996, 1997, we were just that desperate. But there's signals that the government's going to try to do that as well. And it can't. It's vested where it is and kept arm's length from government for good reason. That aside, I think we're looking at a very different Liberal Party that doesn't understand uh, how it got itself into this position. A government that spent money well before COVID, billions of dollars, put us in further hawk for no reason at all. So rather than filling up the proverbial silos, they depleted them. And then when we truly needed it, we sunk into even further debt. 
my concern isn't numbers. It's not about being trendy. It's that you've now compromised in the future, the social programs that have come to protect Canadians, their pensions, their health care, their education, all these things are going to be compromised uh, and are very close to being so in the, in the, uh, in the months to come. One wow. fatal move by the finance minister in her, uh, in a slip of the tongue, uh, could uh, finally get the bond rating agencies to downgrade our credit. If that happens, then uh, all hell will break loose. It's inevitable. Okay. So, gosh, we're you're articulating something that's pretty familiar to you from years past, and that is we're kind of at the, the, the tip here where if you have a downgrade on those bond rating agencies, your interest rates go up and increased debt uh, costs go up, and then you start uh, cannibalizing the real program spending that people rely on in terms of health care and education yes. and all the rest, then you are kissing goodbye the future of your kid's future. That's what's going on here, isn't it? It is. And what it took us to get out of it last time wasn't just some pretty tough decisions and provinces having to see less spending uh, and offered from the federal government. Uh, the pack, you know, we cut back on, on provincial programs and some of the, uh, the obligations that we had. We also had the advantage at the time of a growing U.S. economy and more need for Canadian oil and gas. If you want to know the tractor that helped pull us out of that, it's that we built four or five pipelines. The Americans loved our oil, and uh, mm -hmm. that put billions of dollars back into the pockets of government coffers so we could pay down that debt and get the country back where it needed to be, get the government out of borrowing. That's not something we can look at anymore. We've despoiled that. We have basically gone into our own kennel and soiled it. And as a result of this, our wokeness uh, and our inability to understand that there is a fine balance of finances between you know, fiscal and monetary responsibilities, uh, we've given up the ship. And as a result, it's going to take someone else a long time to fix, if they can at all, fix the fact the Federation is so deeply in debt. And I'm not just talking the federal, the sub-sovereign debt of the province. My province here in Ontario just recorded a $10 billion deficit again. Yeah. And yet wow. it's, you know, it's because of green energy. A lot of it has to do with mm -hmm. green energy and mm -hmm. having to pay people subsidize people so that you, you protect them from the full effect of the Green Energy Act that was delivered 10 years ago by the same liberals running the show in Ottawa. You have a real problem on your hands, and I'm not sure how you're going to resolve it. I'm just glad I'm not in that yeah. business anymore, David. No, and, and I think, Dan, there's something that it's very interesting as I've listened to you carefully over the years. You've um, strategically used the word grifters when it comes to green energy. And I think this is something that is kind of confusing to people because when they go around and they see these windmills turning around and they see these solar panels, they think, gosh, that's the future. That's the green future utopia that we're all striving for, a carbon-free, quote, uh, future, net zero. But that's not what's going on here. Those things are all built and founded on oil and gas, ironically, but it's all subsidized by the government, by you. Is that right, Dan? Correct. In my province, uh, you know, uh, windmill operators were offered uh, uh, access to markets. Didn't matter. They were. They didn't, didn't matter what you know what they at any time whether they were producing or not producing. They always had the ability to sell at much higher prices than the markets. Same for mm -hmm. energy, such as uh, as solar energy. What it did is it forced up the cost of hydro to average people, you know, eight, nine cents a kilowatt hour to a high of 33. Now, we don't pay 33. We pay 18 or 19. The reason we don't pay 33 is because the provincial government since 2018 or 2017 has implemented something called the Ontario Electricity Support Program. That program costs taxpayers $10.3 billion a year and growing. It'll be $20 billion in the next four to five years. In other words, it is sapping monies that would otherwise go for more productive reasons and it's being larded on to our total debt here in Ontario. That's a very scary situation, but it's what happens when you have fools messing around, playing games with green energy, when Ontario boasted among the cleanest energy menus in all of the world. You don't take my word for it. This little thing, which I always often like to keep around, there's yes. what happened in 1965. A little town called Pickering brought in North America's first commercial nuclear right reactors. Zero emission. 
long before it was cool and trendy. We threw those away in favor of pie in the sky technologies. And now yeah. we're, we're paying a price that our grandchildren won't be able to afford. Yeah. Well, what I like about your attitude, Dan, is you've articulated well, not only the case for affordable energy, but with pride, you've said how Canada has one of the best portfolios of clean energy now between hydro, nuclear, um, oil and gas. Like we, we, we should be proud of the energy mix that we already have. Right, Dan? We're the best. We're not boastful, but we are the best. And there are very few people. And where someone does better than us, we'll find out and employ that technology. Because we always want to make sure that we're number one on all scores. ESG, the famous environmental, social, and governance, we're pretty much the top producer, barrel for barrel, for anybody we can compare around the world. And as I mentioned, mm -hmm. you know, we have hydroelectric in Ontario. We've had nuclear in Ontario. Quebec hydroelectric, the Maritimes. Yes, we have coal in some places, and yes, we have oil, and yes, we have natural gas. We're also one of the most energy uh, diverse nations on the face of this planet. So we, mm -hmm. you know, based on the circumstances, based on the geography, really based on the need, based on the climate, the weather, we have uh, harnessed all of these things, and we are an example to the world of how to do these things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's not by accident uh, Nikola Tesla showed up not 50 kilometers from where I am right now here in Milton and uh, built uh, the first uh, operations of the Adam Beck uh, in back in, you know, 1910, 1915. So look, um, we're not big on boasting what we've done, but when we do it, we're among the best and uh, we've got a track record to prove it. We shouldn't allow this generation of cancel culturalists in the liberal party to destroy, undermine and forget that getting here wasn't easy and that they taught us a lot about how to stay here and get better. Right on. Yeah, what a great history and great legacy that we should be proud of. So uh, we need to, to tell that story well. And one of the things I'm also intrigued about, uh, Dan, is this whole so-called ESG movement, the Environmental Social Governance Movement. And I, my interpretation on it, among so many others, is it's really a kind of an index that the WOCUS use to employ on all kinds of use of our money including on our um, beloved Canadian pension plan to impose all kinds of actions and biases on the use of that money. So instead of maximizing my pension return, they're undermining it for their woke causes. Is that your take on it too? Well, I mean, if you're going to undermine a country uh, or undermine our ability to, uh, you know, to make ends meet, you've got to have to have a plan that says, these things can stand on their own. These things will, you know, manage to make money, raise money and fund themselves. Saying that you're going to depend on governments in perpetuity makes no sense. No one will buy something if it's going to always require not just command and control, but, you know, my tax money to support it. Mm -hmm. now, Henry Ford didn't need a subsidy to build the Model T and replace, uh, I'm using an analogy, replace yeah. horse and buggy. Um, mm -hmm. But that's exactly what we're seeing with the electric vehicle. And I'm, I love electric vehicles. They're fun to drive. Mm -hmm. It's all sorts of wonderful, you know, attributes or a computer on wheels. But you can't have a class of people, you know, running poor, paying their tax dollars so others mm -hmm. can have the luxury of driving around these things. And ultimately, we know that these things can be used reversibly. There are times when they can control when you can have it, when you can't have it. Uh, ultimately, uh, you know, they're not free rides. And so when it comes to ESG, I guess the proof is now in the pudding. After 10 years of this stuff, we're now starting to see a lot of the big funders and hedgers move away from them because they are not sustainable without massive dollops of public money to support them. It's... Uh, you know, it's, uh, we used to call these, uh, the NDP, David Lewis's father, Stephen Lewis, or Stephen Lewis's father, David Lewis, used to call it, uh, yeah, the big uh, corporate, uh, what do they call them, corporate welfare, uh, corporate welfare bums. Well, these are now yes. becoming climate ESG grifting bums. And I think we have to recognize their game and the gig is known and it's up. Well, I like the way you're calling these welfare bums out so that good on you <laughs> so as we look to action dan what can citizens do to stop this kind of insanity i mean i know that um uh, you know esg begs the question have a heart-to-heart -heart with your banker 
uh, your financial advisor and say, I don't want my money going into some ESG pot. I want good returns. Uh, that That's certainly a logical action. What are other things that citizens can do here, Dan? Talk to your family, talk to your friends. There's nothing more powerful than the collective desire to make change happen. Uh, you know, I, I, as a politician, have run many campaigns for many liberals in the past. I've run many of my own campaigns or been involved. Mm -hmm. When the public makes up its mind, it's hard to turn that around. And I think the public is mm -hmm. becoming more of the view that the, the status quo is not sustainable. We can't continue down this road of believing that we're all the bad guys and that we have to give money for green uh, pie in the sky ideas mm -hmm. that uh, at the end of the day cost us more than we can possibly afford. Anybody who's out there proposing a lessening in a condition in which we live is somebody we ought not to be listening to. More importantly, we should be telling them to live according to their own rhetoric. Uh, and you'll find that they don't. They're usually the ones driving around the nice vehicles with the 15 different homes, you know, trying to scare the bejesus out of all of us uh, in, in terms of telling us how bad we are and how bad we're doing. I don't fly around the world. I do my own thing. I try to do things on Internet as we do. And we're all doing the best that we can. I think it's important on a weekend like this, Easter weekend, families sit down and have a pull aside with your kids. Say, listen, we can't afford to make ends meet. Here's why. And, you know, this idea that you can have, you know, universities cancel ideas and culture and have this whole idea of critical theory and all of this other stuff that we have been beset with over the past very short period of time. It's time to break the yoke of, uh, of ignorance and uh, cast aside those who do not put as a primary condition for their elected office, the willingness to help the human condition. While recognizing we have responsibility to everything, we also have responsibility to this generation to the next. And we're not going to do it by saddling them with debt or scaring the bejesus out of them, as I've said earlier, by telling there will be no future. And that's exactly where the climate grifters get their support. They get money and then they get the alarmism. I've had enough, and I think most Canadians have, of climate bedwetting. It's time for it to end. I, I like what you're saying, Dan. Let's stop the climate bedwetting, as you say. I've never heard that before, so I'm going to quote you on that, Dan. Right. Um, so if we look at the other side of the equation here, what are the politics of this in the sense that is a lot of this a lot of just, to use your word, grift, it's just a lot of pigs in the trough, to use that analogy, uh, seeking free rent, so to speak, going after the taxpayer's dime and feeding off this, because I just marvel, like you do, at the amount of money that this federal government has spent. It's spent more money than all the previous federal governments combined in our history. It's, it's stunning. So yeah. we have this record amount of, of, of debt if, if memory serves me correctly, it's now, a, it's hard to keep track sometimes at 1.3 $1. $1. trillion, $1. trillion dollars. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's just shocking. And this is all really, I would argue, a immoral tax on the next generation. And I'm not saying there aren't some cases where you borrow money legitimately for building, say, like a capital project, like a bridge that future generations will use. But no, no, no. This is... This is the world where people have not only bought into this nutty world of modern modern monetary theory, where they think tr uh, money grows on trees. Well, oh, doesn't but it? This is a, <laughs> an amazing. So I know you don't believe in that, but what they're doing then is they're using your money and your next kid's generation's money to basically buy political favors with their coalition of groups across the political spectrum. Isn't that what's going on here? They're just doling out money to their friends. Well, they're doing it under the assumption that their environmental scare story works. You know, you've got to cause panic and hysteria for people to give mm -hmm. not only leave of their of their mind, but also be willing to open up and give what money they have towards the cause. Mm -hmm. And yet it's proven to be a fallacy time mm -hmm. and time and time again. And so I think we need to look at uh, the fact that what has been erected here is not going to be dismantled overnight. Big climate has been around for a long time, and they become mm -hmm. more and more powerful by make, riling people up into the belief that somehow yeah. they're responsible for the world coming to an end. Um, however, we approach saying it's saying it's really a huge industry. It's a oh, massive, that massive, trillions of dollars. People's lives. 
trillions of dollars. Look at the climate summits, 70, 80,000 people showing up, flying in from all parts of the world, you know, from mm -hmm. administrators, bureaucrats, business, mm -hmm. even business has to say something. Yeah. Tell me an organization or business that doesn't talk about its sustainable side. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's hard wired into our minds. The problem with all that is it, sooner or later, someone is going to say the emperor has no clothes. Someone is going to call them on it. Uh, someone is going to finally say, look, the entire thing is predicated on gas. And you're saying that this is bringing the world to an end. And if we don't do something and pay a lot of money up front, uh, and we don't d diminish our population, we don't uh, you know, begin this whole process of, uh, uh, you know, shunning other parts of the world that have never been able to enjoy what we get. You know, people in Africa who burn dung for their, to make their meal. And it's that, mm -hmm. you know, the emissions from that real pollution that's causing them to, to be very sick and denying them the opportunity to use coal that they produce for their mm -hmm. own needs. These are things that, you know, these are the kind of discussions we would normally have in university among academics and students. But you're not allowed. The conformists that want to run the show, and I'm a, a, really a, a sidebar of a big climate, really dis, you know shows the eclipse of reason among a variety of very important issues that in the past we would have tackled very easily. So it's going to take a shift back. We have to break. And I think we're starting to see that break. And if that doesn't happen, then geopolitically, let me put back the foreign affairs cap. Russia, mm. China. North Korea, Iran, and a handful of other nations are prepared to take it away from us. We want to sit back and be woke and be stupid and be ridiculous. Uh, we better watch what's happening because as we're getting weaker, they're getting a lot stronger. Well said. So speaking of your, your former foreign affairs hat, Dan, yeah. um, you've seen this file over the years, the influence of the Communist Party of China in the Western world across well, the broader world, but including in Canada. Just a few weeks ago, we've had the so-called inquiry start up into Chinese um, influence into the Canadian scene, including federal elections. What's your take on that? Are, do you have any hope of getting to the, that we'll get to the bottom of the amount of uh, Chinese influence in our society? I think it frightens those who know that they benefited from it. And that may be at least two of the three political parties that we are familiar with in areas outside of Quebec. Um, and that's probably why we're not going to get to the bottom of it under this government. We know that uh, the NDP will block any attempt at trying to get greater scrutiny. We're seeing this with the, uh, the Winnipeg labs and, you know, the, uh, the theft Indeed. of what could be material that was ultimately used in the Wuhan labor laboratory to create COVID, which for which the world is now there. Some scary stuff that Canada was, playing no small part in, a, in, a, in, you know, indirectly or negligently allowing these things to happen. Whatever the consequence, the reality is it's going to take a whole new government uh, to expose the extent to which our public servants and our government and our governance has been compromised. It's a very scary thought when you think that while governments are too busy pretending, uh, you know, CO2 is a bad thing, we have uh, the entire country being literally taken from under us. And I, 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 I worry deeply that the influence isn't just about China. It's many other nations that have an interest mm -hmm. in Canada may very well have people here who have an interest that is not completely Canadian. And we're starting to see that in other manifests in other areas. The kind of anti-Semitism that I'm seeing is not incongruent with what we're seeing uh, in terms of tensions between groups. And we have a government that seems to be pandering to it. Very scary. I never thought I would see the day, but that's exactly what's happening in Canada. It's enemies from within, and it's the fact that we have been compromised that is very much part of the narrative and the discourse that we need to consider in this country as we head toward an awards election, which we have to be mindful that this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I, I I would share your concerns. So um, what a good challenge, an articulate invitation to open our eyes to what's going on in our country in, in terms of many things, including foreign influence. It is interesting that Canada's National um, uh, uh, Microbiology Lab in Winnipeg, a level four lab, was, uh, it's now documented uh, well, uh, the kind of um, uh, spies that were leaking information systematically 
to senior officials within uh, the Chinese military, the People's Liberation Army, um, of information regarding um, you know, uh, scientific data that was, was very important to the Wuhan lab and the development of COVID-19. So I am disappointed that the current federal government is not just fessing up and releasing everything around that so we can get to the bottom of this because this really undermines the level of trust does it not in our institutions and whether or not people are actually working on behalf of and serving canadians you have to wonder why the government has done so much to try to suppress this if it were not for the fact that it would be concerned like every other canadian true canadian that is concerned about the sovereignty of the nation um Attempted obfuscation, uh, getting this RCMP to look in different directions, political interference. Um, you know, we need to get to the bottom of this, but it's very clear that uh, by now it is evident to most Canadians that the country has been compromised and likely the results of the last election, which again reinforces the notion that this government is uh, is governing very much on uh, uh, on a basis uh, of. Uh, uh, of uh, a mandate that it really didn't have, or to the extent just, to which that ended. Uh, I, I don't want to bury that headline. So you're saying that the theory of of foreign Chinese influence in the last federal election and how that may have changed the outcome of the last election, that's a legitimate that's a legitimate theory that we can't dismiss. We've got to get no. to the bottom of that. No, and if there were 10 ridings that were affected as a result of it, that would lessen the Liberal NDP coalition by 10 seats, in which case there would be no coalition. This is pretty serious. It's hold, this is a government that's dangling by a thread. Like it or dislike it, it wouldn't be able to hold, you know, the kind of sway in what is now going to be, you know, perhaps in the parliamentary British tradition, the longest minority government that has ever served when it's done after its four and a half, four years. Um, so what this really tells us is that there may be a significant amount of illegitimacy to this government as a result of what is there. Now, we won't find this out well, because the government's doing its best to muzzle, as it's done on so many fronts, from the WE scandal to the SNC scandal to, uh, you know, I mean, there's there's so many of them. It's, it's really hard to keep track. Um, and I would never have thought a government able or capable of hanging on surviving even one of those. Me thinking well, how we had to go through the Gomery issue back in 2004, mm, 2005. We didn't survive that. Canadians held their governments to account. So did the media. But now you have a media that won't. These are dogs that won't hunt. And they're, in fact, trained and paid not to. And this scares me because the usual checks and balances that you need in the system to maintain its viability and its integrity have been seriously compromised under the aegis of one man, the prime minister, who, as I said earlier, is dangling by a thread. If there were 10 seats that were compromised. The outcome had changed. It would have changed the, the dynamic of the of parliament, the seating of the House of Commons today. We wouldn't have a Trudeau government today. I'm confident of that. Okay, so I encourage your audience to take note of Dan's analysis here regarding that. And I would also encourage us to remember that there's been some very significant points of legislation introduced now. Uh, Dan, we we see Bill, what is it, C-63, the so-called on harms uh, safety legislation, which in my perspective is really about undermining people's yeah. freedom of speech, shutting down based Trojan on horse. some bureaucratic or czar based on what they think hate speech is. I mean, it's just a disaster when it comes to shutting down freedom of speech, which is so vital to our democracy. And then you have the whole reality that um, you you have a government that is funding systematically over 2000 media outlets across the country, and they've yes. all got to sign on to their code of conduct and how they're going to cover certain angles to issues. They, they, they have done a masterful job governing like they've got this massive majority when in fact they're a minority government hanging on the thread to systematically undermine all those institutions, as you say. Am I looking at it too cynically? No, and I think it brings forth uh, the idea that uh, Justin Trudeau, in fact, uh, admired China's basic dictatorship. You're seeing authoritarianism flexing its muscle in a number of areas. And they are able to control part of the narrative and the agenda by having so many people who are beholden to them. Like it or not, if you have 
and require money from the government to continue functioning, you are in effect an appendage of that government. You are a proxy of that government. Now, it doesn't mean that you're always going to follow everything they say, hook, law, and sinker. But in the past, the traditional independence and perception of independence of the media was always something we could count upon to ensure that the public was always kept informed of uh, what was happening by our legislators. And yeah, there were many times I got taken out and, uh, you know, uh, scrutinized. And I, I was good with that. That's what the system, that's how the system functions. It's healthy. It's dynamic. It's no longer. And that's why I think we're seeing a stasis in our electoral system, which uh, combined with all of these other factors that we've just mentioned, foreign interference, uh, unwillingness to uh, to to scrutinize bad behavior, the ad scam. I mean, there's a, a, a myriad of these that have come out, any one of which should have taken down any legitimate government in the past mm -hmm. and has not done so now. It suggests to me that uh, the game is almost over and our democracy has been badly wounded here. I don't know how we're going to recover it quickly, but we need to get to another election quickly and settle the score. And if Canadians from Montreal and Toronto still want to vote for this nonsense, well, you know, I, I, just make sure it's it's uh, it's fair and democratic. But at the end of the day, if you still think that the way the country is going is the proper way, um, then maybe uh, maybe a, a trip around the world to countries where this has already happened might be in order for those who think very little of our nation and its major, noticeable, globally noticed decline. Wow. Well, Dan, it's been a pleasure to talk with you. It's um, not been easy because what you've shared with us are really, in many ways, um, profound messages, uh, but also prophetic ones regarding uh, the state of our country today and, and what it, where its trajectory is in the future. And I want to thank you for uh, the kind of leadership and courage that you have and as president of the um, uh, Canadians for Affordable Energy and for joining us today. It's been a pleasure, David. Thanks for having me and uh, look forward to doing this again. Well, thank you everyone as well for joining us uh, this live discussion. We really appreciate your questions and your comments and we really value that. We want you to also encourage you to like the program, share it if you think it's important, get the conversation going with your family and friends as the Honorable Dan Mateek talked about. But in the meantime, I wanna wish you a blessed Monday, Thursday and Easter and wish you all the very best. Until next week at the same time, thank you for joining us.